Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cast. Borag Thun, Earthlets, and welcome back to the 2000 AD Thrillcast. I'm your host, Mulchar. Apologies for our absence over the last few weeks. I wasn't kidding when I said it is getting a bit mad here. Lots of stuff going on behind the scenes, but also lots of stuff coming out to you, Earthlets, around the globe uh, in particular. Uh, and this is what this episode is all about. The Battle Action Special, which is the hardcover that is out now, written by Garth Ennis with art from Kevin O'Neill, John Higgins, Chris Byrne and PJ Holden, Keith Burns, Patrick Goddard and the legendary Mike Dory. This is uh, an absolutely gorgeous package um, evoking the uh, classic war comics uh, from uh, Battle Action when the two uh, titles merged but uh, also bringing something fresh. There's a fantastic uh, Kids Will OK story in here. Um, this is available uh, on June 8th from all good comic book stores. Now, it will be in uh, normal bookstores in September. So we're doing a staged release. Uh, Garth uh, and some of the team will be at uh, Gosh Comics doing a signing and also at the Enniskillen uh, Comics Festival in Northern Ireland. So check out the details of those on our Facebook page and also on our website. But uh, you, you want to be getting this, not least because, as well as that uh, Andy Clark, Andy Clark uh, doing the cover, there's also the Web Shop exclusive cover, which is by John Higgins. Now, uh, that's just 70s-tastic. So <laughs> that's uh, Dredger from uh, John Higgins. I just can't stop looking at it. It's the jaw, I think. Um, so... You really want to get a copy of uh, that. It's available from all good comic book stores and also from our web shop and app. Um, on this episode, we're talking to Garth uh, about uh, battle action, how formative it was for him as, as, as a, uh, somebody who's into their military history, but also uh, as a comic book writer. And then we've got artists Keith Burns and Patrick Goddard talking about their work, both people who who uh, bring a, the ethos of battle action to uh, to the right thing, absolutely packed with with, with action. So yes, um, hope you enjoy these uh, interviews. Uh, uh, we shall be we shall definitely be back in two weeks' time. He said, "Touch wood." Um, so uh, we shall see you then. In the meantime, take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Grab a couple of your battle action and splendid Verthrig. So uh, we're here to talk about the Battle Action Special, which is uh, out imminently. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to welcome back uh, Garth Ennis to the podcast. Welcome back, Garth. Thank you, Michael. Good to see you. And you, and you. Now, uh, this this was the promised chat from uh, last time you were on to talk about Hort the Slayer. Right. Um, and... Uh, I wanted to, to, to get you on because when we've when we've chatted and, and when you've um, talked about this this project publicly, it's always been very much uh, this is a labour of love. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about a how it came about, mm. b why you have such affection for this? For, I mean, it's a very particular phase of this comic as well, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it came about simply because I really enjoyed writing for the battle and action specials in 2020 and uh, loved seeing those titles back and wanted to see more, but didn't get any real sense of urgency. So really just thought, I know a way to make this happen. I'll do it. And I pitched the idea to Keith and Oliver, you know, seven stories. We'll get the best artists we can. We'll call it battle action. And um, and they went for it, and that's why we're here. As to as to why uh, why it's called battle action, um, as you know, when action was folded into battle, it became battle action. But they they were loath to get rid of the, the action title. I think it meant a lot 
uh, around the office. And in fact, it, it stayed as battle action for something like three and a half years from uh, 78 to late 81. Um, which, if you think about it, is much, much longer than 2080 and Star-Lord, 2080 and Tornado, you name it. Usually they just let those things quietly slip away. And it seemed to me that it was in this period that Battle published or continued its best strips. Johnny Red continued. Um, from Action, you had Hellman and Dredger. And in the period, you also had, you had Crazy Keller, you had the general dies at dawn. You had the Sarge continuing. Charlie's War began. Uh, later, Fighting Man, Death Squad, War Dog. And of course, during that period, Charlie's War starts. So it seems to me that you hit a kind of a sweet spot, maybe because the talent that came over from action was able to be just thrown into the new comic. Um, but uh, they, it seems to me they really did make the most of the opportunity and battle was at its best. It, it, had, um, it had passed its early uh, sort of awkward phase where it was finding its feet. Don't get me wrong, it was, of course, incredibly successful. But in creative terms, it was at that point where the strips were going a stage further. Now, I should, I should say that there's also a reprint of Darkie's Mob in that period, in the battle action period, which is cheating a bit because the original strip did see print before battle action, but we'll throw it in there anyway. Um, because what I'm, what I'm getting at really is that, that this is when the comic is at its best. This is the period when it turns a corner and starts doing superior stuff, things that can stand the test of time, but before it starts to wane in the early 80s and eventually folds into action force which is the, the toy stuff, which is very, very different. And it was that period that I wanted to capture, that I wanted to celebrate as battle action basically being the best period in battle's history. You're... That was irritating. Um, I, I was pressing the button and it was uh, not doing that. Yeah. Um, but it, it's very easy, uh, and I, I, I do it myself, to overfocus on action because, you know, it was the comic that got banned and, you yeah. know, it was incredibly violent and everything. But, of course, Battle was where they made the formula. Mm -hmm. with, where where Mills, you got Mills and Wagner, Jerry Finley Day, of course, um, working on uh, a, a, a response to DC Thompson's Warlord, but just having that little sprinkle of of something else that made it, made it really special. Um, so that, that, that's the kind of the beginning. Yeah, yes, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have um, 2000 AD if, if, if it weren't for action, but you definitely wouldn't have 2000 AD if it weren't for, for, for battle in the first place. That's absolutely right. It's, um, it, it's, it's definitely Pat and John bringing that anti-establishment, largely working class feel to the thing mm. so that it's no longer aimed at nice boys. Uh, it's, it's also, it, it has their trademarks. It's dark, funny, visceral, action-packed, and the dialogue is a bit better than had been seen in comics up to that point, in war comics up to that point. Nobody, for instance, shouts, come on, chaps. Uh, unless they're immediately <laughs> killed while some sergeant or other subordinate figures out the smart way to do the job. Mm. Um, so it, it, it has all their trademarks and it's where it begins. Um, yes, action is then launched. Uh, that's a big initial success. That hits trouble. But then, of course, they hit the jackpot with 2000 AD. Mm. The rest is history. We talked yeah. a little bit about that last time. Mm. Um, you, you could, you could, in a way, call battle action the comic that was never supposed to happen. Because, of course, ideally, you would have had battle and action and 2000 AD as this trio that mm. simply survived for much longer. Although I was thinking about this. Uh, you've read Martin Barker's book, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a tremendous book. I mean ridiculous that it hasn't been reprinted because it's on eight books for 300 quid or something like that. Um, but in his book, Martin suggests that perhaps action was always going to go wrong. Now his, his theory is that once Pat goes over to 2000 AD and takes his hand off the tiller, his guidance is gone. And perhaps the, the new guys 
can't really use the available talent. They don't have the same sense of story uh, of putting teams together uh, that Pat does. I would point to, to, to a, a, an even stronger possibility, which is that if you were putting out a comic like action, which is supposed to go too far, eventually you're going to go too far. Mm. If you see what I'm saying. And it's bound, it's bound to get canceled sooner or later because someone will do something. The thing is essentially created to to make trouble. That's how it gains its rep. And if you consider it from that point of view, well, then maybe battle action was always going to happen because it it's hard to imagine the guys in the office at the time thinking, someone thinking, we're bound to go too far eventually. We're bound to run into trouble, but we can't always fold it into battle. We can always do what everyone does when a comic fails and fold it into it, the one that's most like it in the line. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 possible that battle action, I mean, I described it as the comic that was never meant to happen, but maybe it's the comic that was always going to happen. Mm. Because there's, there's, there's also that that um, issue of violence, you know, mm. which, which is the, the the thing that brought down action. And again, this this is a point that Martin Barker makes in um, Story of a Violent Comic. Um which is that uh, action's violence was rebellious. It was nihilistic. Uh, you know, it was, it was very much of, it, of, it, of its historical moment. But there was, while it went further than battle, battle was also very violent, but had not, yes. not received the same amount of, uh, of attention from the moralizers. Mm. And, and then you get, you get 2000 AD, which uh, science fiction allows that kind of hyper real uh, violence to happen, but it's happening to robots and dinosaurs and and clones right. and mutants and everything. And action sits sits as the 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 the, the um, kind of the sore thumb of that trio. Yeah. In in that uh, you know, war violence is fine because it's legitimate. Sci-fi violence is fine, particularly with Judge Dredd, because that's legitimate and it's far away and it's not real. Whereas there's just there was just that element of this is too close, you know. Particularly with uh, the the obvious contenders like look out for lefty, um, uh, kids rule okay. Where you know I I, I read the first episodes of um, kids rule okay just recently, and <laughs> even like you know he's four, 45 years odd, odd later, and I'm like, oh my god, did they really think they like someone gets run over with like, with like a motorbike? Mm-hmm. And not in a kind of oh, it's just happening just off of panel. Yeah, it's literally you see the guy goes under the wheels, like right there, and then there's a knife fight a couple of uh, a couple of episodes, well, a couple of pages later. It's I, I mean, it's just it is just incredible that they thought they could get away with it, or maybe they, it, maybe they yeah. did, maybe they didn't, you know. It, it is. It is. Um, I mean, you're quite right <clears throat> uh, on battle. Dave Hunt could cite actual. Mm. military history and memoir to justify some of the violence. He did that in Darkie's Mob. There were complaints about the violence in Darkie's Mob. And uh, Dave said that he he wrote back and said, well, look, you know, th- this happened to people during the Burma campaign and here's when and here's how. Mm. And um, glory days, really, because uh, in those days, when if you replied uh, to someone who'd made a complaint, you never heard from them again. So, <laughs> so great. Um, 2008, of course, as you say, uh, it's happening to robots. And also, of course, the violence is being delivered by a law officer, mm. by, by the voice of authority. Action sticks out like a sore thumb because there it is. And what's, what's its excuse? <laughs> what's its excuse for all this anti-authoritarian violence? Yeah. Uh, for, um, for people not knowing their place for a football hooligan and a scumbag working class secret agent and all the rest of them. Mm. How do you justify that? And there it is sitting there. Um, and perhaps following on from what we're saying, the inevitable happens. Mm. Well, I mean, that's, that's uh, the, the interesting thing about this. Is it, what, what, where, where did you come into this? We, we, were you there at the beginning for, for, um, action and, and battle or was battle action the one that you came to as a kid? Yeah, I, I started on 2000 AD in 77, almost at the very beginning. And then a year later 
summer of 78, I started reading Battle Action, by which stage, of course, action was out of the picture. Mm. And I was vaguely aware that there, there'd been a comic called Action. Occasionally, you would see action annuals and, and action specials being advertised. But I hadn't read Action. Um, I only realized that comparatively recently. I thought I had seen more of Action as a kid than I actually had. I hadn't. Hmm. Um, it was it was after it joined with Battle that I got to know the, the few characters that made it. So probably my first chance to really examine action strips in detail came when I bought Martin's book hmm. in 1990 and was able to read long stretches of Hookjaw, Dredger. Um, the sport one was called The Spinball Wars it, 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 in yeah. Battle, but in action it was death game it was death game 2000 or something yeah um so it was it was only then i was able to read large chunks of this and and understand the role action had played and and, and the place it occupied in the history of that period mm. for me it was battle action it, it was picking it up and just being instantly sucked in uh that the, there was some very strong stuff being published in the summer of 78 you, you had johnny red with colhoun still on the art before he'd gone over to charlie's war you had the sarge dredger was drawn by john uh john cooper um you had uh crazy keller i think was around about then um it it, it really did grab me straight away so that was where i got into battle action oh, is is this is this the foundation of your your interest in military history and World War II mm-hmm. history. Like literally this title is the yeah. thing that sparked that. That's incredible. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I would have been eight years old and it, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. I'm also reading commandos and the picture libraries. Uh, I'm seeing the, the big, uh, kind of widescreen war movies of the 60s and 70s either they're on tv like the battle of britain and where eagles dare and kelly's heroes or i'm seeing at the them at the movies like a bridge too far but it's like battle action seems to come along and just crystallize this interest for me uh, and i and i think i think what it comes down to is 2008 is great, and I love 2008, and I do keep reading it. But as I'm looking at battle action, I'm dimly aware, less dimly as time goes on, that these are stories that are based on things that happened to people, that happened to real people, Mm. Um, that real men and women did these things. And that gets a lock on my imagination in, in a way that few other stories, few other kinds of fiction can really um, was it were it not for the sheer strength of talent being poured into 2080 at the time, I might have gradually left it behind as as fantasy. Mm. Uh, but of course, 2080 was the greatest comic in the galaxy at that point, <laughs> and so you know I wasn't going to be letting go of that. Not with Cursed Earth and Robo Hunter and all that going on. Well, let's 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 talk a, a, a little bit about the, the the battle action special now. Mm. Um, you, the, specifically, your choice of strips mm-hmm. for this. So you, you've you've got your sandbox. Mm-hmm. You can you can do whatever you want, and you choose uh, John uh, Johnny Red, uh, Scream of the Stuckers, the Sarge, which we've just reprinted, uh, Crazy Keller, Dredger, uh, Hellman of Hammer Force, uh, Glory and Glory Rider, Kid Ruler K. And then uh, Nina Petrova and the Angels of Death, which is um, right. a character from um, Johnny Red. Mm-hmm. Take us through your your process. Was, was it an easy choice to go um, with these particular characters? Comparatively easy, yeah. First of all, as I said to Oliver and Keith at the time, we've got to do seven because we've got to get that seven big stories inside thing that <laughs> all the great battle covers had. Um, and because we're celebrating battle and action, we're going to have uh, three from uh, four from battle and three from action, which is how the relaunched battle action issue uh, came out. Now, I didn't want necessarily to have the actual stories that appeared in that issue back in 78. I, I have no interest in the spinball wars, for instance. 
Um, Joe Two Beans and Major Easy are among the better battle strips, but they just don't appeal to me. Mm. So I figured, all right, we'll start with Johnny Red because he was probably the, the most popular strip overall in Battles Run and also my personal favorite. Mm. Um, the Sarge, another favorite of mine, uh, one that well, a good team story uh, and an old reliable. It's it's in the comic for, gosh, I think almost three years. Yeah, uh, Crazy Keller is one I've always had a, a particular affection for. It's Alan Hebden's second go at that um, roguish loner mm. story, heavily influenced by the movies that he'd first had a go at with um, Major Easy. Mm. Keller uh, being an American somehow fits that that uh, that notion better for me. Plus, I just loved it as a kid. I loved it, the characters. I loved the fact that he had a Jeep with huge machine guns on the back, the, the recoil of which I'm pretty sure would have turned the vehicle over, but but never mind. Um, I liked uh, I liked the fact that the character himself is. A bit dodgy. He's a signals officer in the U.S. Army, but he's also uh, a war profiteer and black marketeer. And he basically makes as much money as he can while doing the Germans as much damage as he can. Mm. Um, so I always find something funny about that. Dredger, Dredger's just irresistible. Here's the first of the characters from action, of course. Uh, Dredger's just wrong and uh, wrong in every way. And so therefore, you know, a natural fit for me, probably the, the one strip in the thing that will fit uh, that other side of my work that people sometimes expect that the kind of boys preacher crossed hitman side of things. Mm. Um, Hellman, of course, another action classic that works perfectly in battle almost could almost have been born for battle. Um, Kids rule okay. It's the weird one. It's the one that's not like the others. It's it's not a strip I had any affection for as a kid. I, I didn't even read it. I didn't care for it much when I read the reprints, except as, as a kind of a curio. But it did give me an opportunity for some commentary on what happened to action and on the strip itself, because, of course, you have that famous cover, mm. don't you? Um, the famous cover in which a bit of what you might call mistaken identity, <laughs> the cop that's about to die who isn't a cop, yeah, actually due to a coloring mistake on, uh, in the character's clothing, um, causes a huge hullabaloo. So that got me thinking like uh, about a story in which you ask, what am I really seeing? What's really going on here? Um, so really, it's it's the story has has two parts to it. One is a direct continuation of the event on that cover, and at the same time, uh, another story which runs concurrent with it, in which we get some direct commentary on a let me make clear highly fictionalized <laughs> version of. Uh, of the controversy and how it unfolded for the editorial team involved. Um, th that's where I get to do something I love doing and probably do too much. Well, I would do more if, if, if I could, um, where I fictionalize real people, right. which is something I find irresistible. <laughs> um, but as I say, it's the one that's not like the others. It's, it's not a battle action strip, but it's appropriate because it allows us to talk about action. Um, and finally, Nina Petrova and the Angels of Death. Nina was one of my favorite characters in Johnny Red. She's um, one of the most, I think, one of the most important female characters in British comics. Uh, she's um, she's based on real life, on, on the woman who flew with the night, which is the famous Soviet uh, woman's uh, night bombing regiment. Um, and also she predates uh, all of them. Anderson, Hershey, Purity, Venus, Blue Jean. She she was there first, um, and so it seemed to me only appropriate to give finally give her her own strip after forty something years. Mm. Um, there are two others. You mentioned Screamer of the Stukas. He's kind of a guest star in the Johnny Red strip. He's he's a splendid character who didn't have that great a story. It didn't last very long, but he's a great character because he's such an unspeakable shit. So he makes he's excellent for a cameo role in Johnny Red, and again later 
in the Nina Petrova strip. The, um, the Johnny Red and Nina Petrova strips sort of top and tail the special. Uh, and then you also mentioned Glory Rider, which is very like Screamer, isn't really a very strong story, but has enough enjoyable elements to make it uh, a, a good kind of a crossover with Hellman. Mm. Um, and in both cases, of course, Johnny Red and Screamer, you have aviation and Hellman and Glory Rider, you have armor tanks. So thematically it works quite well. Anyway, that's how they all ended up in the special. <laughs> with, like you say, you, there's, there's, there's a couple of ways you've, you've brought characters together that, that mm. uh, some of whom might not necessarily work uh, so well just, just on their own. Um, and it seems like, you know, reading through it, it seems like just a natural fit that, that you mm. know, you've, you've, you've already, yeah. one, one, one thing that really struck me <laughs> reading it was uh, uh, shared universes now are de rigueur. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, everything's got to be a shared universe. And battle, uh, be, be, because they because they all share that one conflict, you know, they're, they are, all, all mm-hmm. are technically taking place within the same time frame, within roughly the same part of the world. So it just, it was, a, it's, it's almost like a, a shared universe, but by accident, you know, mm-hmm. you can just throw them into each other's, yeah. Um, orbits and it absolutely works. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the one instance of it in the original run was that you had Rat Pack and Major Easy, mm. same writer, same artist, obvious fit. Uh, but of course, it was it was really Pat who blazed the way for shared universe stuff in 2000 AD. You know, with Robusters into ABCs into Nemesis into, but it just seemed to me to be the obvious way to go. I mean, I wanted to write Screamer because I, I did just to enjoy the character, but I couldn't get a, I couldn't even get a 10 page story out of Screamer. <laughs> the, the trouble with the way that story is structured is of course it's uh, Screamer who's an evil Nazi pilot uh, at the start of the strip kills our plucky hero's dad at Dunkirk hmm. and our plucky hero, who's this little shit called Jimmy Fletcher, then spends 15 issues trying to track down Screamer, who just, who meanwhile uh, is causing havoc in various theaters of war. And Jimmy is a boring waste of space. And Screamer, of course, you can't take your eyes off him because what awful thing will he do next? Um, in, in my, probably my favorite Screamer moment towards the end of the story, uh, as Germany's losing and the Russians are overrunning the German lines and, and air bases, Screamer's about to evacuate this airfield and the officer in charge is with him. And uh, Screamer says, you know, you've been good to me while I've been here, so I'm going to do you a favor. And the guy goes, oh, you're, you're going to fly me out in the back of your Stuka? No, I'm going to loan you my pistol so you can shoot yourself before the Russians get here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stuff like that is irresistible but Jimmy Fletcher hasn't got a good line in the entire thing or, yeah. or a good scene um, so that, that's why this will be my one shot at writing Otto Screamer <laughs> and as he, he works far better as a guest star yeah. being, being a shit than he does as you know the the lead character in this. Strip. See, and, and, pe- and people wonder where the uh, the humor in the boys and preacher comes from. <laughs> well, in, in that instance, thank you, Jerry Finley Day. But um, but you you really have to you know actually that just mentioning Jerry, you really have to give it to him because um, he's also the writer of the Sarge, mm. uh, the writer and creator of the Sarge, and it was reading that strip that taught me a lot about character, but it also taught me a lot about building up a, a cast of dangerous but likable characters mm. who you then knock off one by one for maximum emotional payoff. <laughs> and that's a lesson I really did take to heart. <laughs> with, 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 with strips like these, um, when you're particularly when you're, you're dealing with something that you have a lot of affection for, that, that yeah. is such a, a profound formative experience. You've done other war comics, you know, I can see the, the, the poster for the, for the Sara um, mm. uh, book yeah. behind you. Um, was there, was there ever a danger of this slipping into uh, pastiche or just, I mean, it, 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 it is a nostalgic project, but, you know, pure nostalgia of just mimicking rather than necessarily having the heart of those of those stories. 
Yeah, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to to mimic the writing style of someone like Jerry Finley Day or Tom Tully because I'll I'll just I'll I'll never have never quite have the balls to write such utterly functional dialogue hmm. as they did. You know, gotta do whatever it is the plot needs me to do, and you know, and that's a balloon. I, I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't do that. Um, as to as to the general notion of, of pastiche, uh, it actually goes back to what we were talking about with, with Hawk the Slayer. Um, I'm not interested in a piss take mm-hmm. of these things. I'm not interested in poking fun at them. I'm not interested in that old notion of so bad it's good. If I thought something was bad, I wouldn't bother with it in the first place. Uh, I'm interested in isolating what I think is great about it. Mm and trying to bring that out for a modern audience while at the same time, not losing sight of the old stuff. Uh, So no, it's, it's not a danger for me at the same time. I am aware that even the darker war stories in, in the battle action special are a step or two removed from Sarah Hmm. and from the lion and the eagle, which I've got running at the minute and the other war stories I've done, even though my war stories in many cases, definitely do have their roots in what I read in Battle Action. It's, it's certainly, looking at, at uh, you know stories like Nina Petrova, um, you, you've 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 got real elements in these. You know, actual stories. It, 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 even something as, as straightforward as the, as the Sarge. You know, he, it, um, in the original strip, he, he was at um, Tobruk. Um, and then you know you've got various other uh, uh, situations. I, I, is it, is it always that 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 element that you've mentioned earlier that, that that when you became aware that these, while not personally based on real people, mm. are nonetheless living, telling stories in a real setting. You know the the, the, mm. the, the, the it, it, it it is uh, illuminating. Uh, uh, real events. Do you think that's what you find so intoxicating about these? That the, there is that element of authenticity to, to 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 the characters, even though their stories are fictional. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I, th- I think the Sarge, for all its hyperbole, is a decent portrait of the British foot sloggers lot in World War Two. If if we begin in the Battle of France, moving through North Africa and all that up and down, advance and retreat, uh, Sicily. Italy, and then after Jerry Finley Day leaves the strip, you're into Normandy and the Low Countries and Germany. I think it's I think it's a decent portrait of the course of the war for the British soldier. Um, Johnny Red, there was never anyone quite like Johnny Red, but uh, no one else had found a way to tell British comic readers about the realities of the Russian front and the contribution of the Russian people to victory over the Nazis in World War II. And I know Charlie's War is rightly remembered as the best strip in battle for what it taught us about the realities of the First World War. But some of the uh, portrayals that Tully and Colquhoun, or later Tully and Cooper, manage of the fighting in Leningrad and Stalingrad, I think is quite incredible for a boys' comic of the time. That, that, that perhaps sums up to answer your question, that perhaps sums up the import the importance in this field of of battle action and what it achieved. Because it's interesting you, you, you mentioned about um, uh, that Johnny Red was 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 away. I mean, I suppose it it's kind of no different to American films sticking in uh, like Tom Cruise sticking right. in the, uh, the the you know the Japanese um, wars of, uh, of of unification, but. Um, right. But because, uh, of course, in the same comic, you've got Hellman of Hammer Force, who is a Nazi, but mm-hmm. he's not actually a Nazi. He's, uh, you know, that 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 um, that figure of <laughs> the, the, the the Wehrmacht. You know, my my, my, my grandfather wasn't a Nazi, so it's so, yeah. so it's all fine. But the way that they made uh, the, the the so often the way they made him a. Uh, not like likable is the wrong word, but uh, a protagonist you didn't necessarily despise was because he was set against the horror of the Russian advance. So you or, 
or falling over himself to be <laughs> nice to British and American and Australian and Canadian. Exactly, exactly. Things. So you've, you've, you've got the two, two strips doing quite opposite things with the same with the same situation, if you see what I mean. Yes, I, I do. I mean, in, in both cases, I, I think the idea is to show you the war from another perspective. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, in the case of Hellman, you have to make him as nice a guy as possible. Uh, in fact, to the point of impossibility, really. In the case of Johnny Red, there's something, I suppose, I don't exactly know what it would be, that uh, perhaps proved resistant. Um to the notion of Russian soldiers in World War II. Maybe it was because at the time the comic was seeing print, they were our enemies in the Cold War, mm. ostensibly. Maybe there was just something alien about them. Um, but I, th but whatever it was, it was deemed that Johnny Red was the only way to get this done, put a British character in this setting and get him there by a means that actually isn't impossible. It's what he does and how he survives once he's there mm -hmm. that makes it impossible. Um, it does. I said this to um, Eamon on the Mega City uh, book club. Uh, it does help that Johnny's a Brit, actually, because it makes him an outsider and he's always got that to outsider's perspective. Mm -hmm. Um a Russian might not, a Russian character of the era might not bat an eyelid at um, putting women in combat, putting children in combat in the defense of Leningrad, uh, training dogs to run under tanks with bombs strapped to their backs, propping the wounded up at the windows of hospitals with rifles so they can sacrifice themselves so that others get away, uh, defending Leningrad when you could just pull back and leave it. Johnny is the one who always has that outsider's perspective that, oh my God, they're going to do this. They're really going to do this. Whereas the Russians don't bat an eyelid. Mm. Um, in the very first issue I read, actually, it was the first issue, first episode of Johnny Red set over Stalingrad. He sees uh, a German attack founder on the Russian defenses and suddenly it gets down to hand to hand. He's flying over this and he sees people killing each other with shovels and bayonets and rocks. And he says, if ever two nations treated each other like animals mm. and that that outsider's perspective, I think, helps us as a British audience of the time to have an outsider. Um, it would be harder to justify that now. And in fact, no one would even even bother trying it. When I wrote Sarah uh, and other upcoming stuff about Russian woman uh, soldiers and uh, I wrote about the night, which is I, I just wrote all the characters as Russian. There was no need to have a Johnny Red, but at the time, it was really the only way to get that done. Mm. Oh, you, you mentioned a word there, which which very much neatly sums up uh, so many of these characters, which is out, which is outsiders, which is loners. You know, whether it's it's um, yeah. uh, 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 Nina, who's effectively a. Uh, almost sacrificed just, you know, uh, cannon fodder thrown with the, the worst kind of planes at, mm. uh, you know, far more sophisticated uh, enemy forces. You've got Dredger, who's just a bastard. Um, you know, these these are, uh, is, I, mean, is, I mean, is that the, the appeal, that kind of um, almost adolescent kind of desire for figures who are special, who are different, you know, and so that it kind of reflects on our own, sense of of identity i, I think so I, th I think it's probably again john and pat figuring out that that cool loner figure mm. will take you a long way um and that uh if you are going to have that character join up with others they'd better be a weird bunch of outcasts too mm. if you look at falcon squadron that johnny joins up with they that they've initially been abandoned and told to simply kill themselves in suicide attacks johnny galvanizes them and says no we can survive we can do more damage to the enemy by staying alive and that's how falcon squadron are reborn and how johnny finds a home but they're they're a bunch of uh, peculiar, scruffy uh, weirdos. You know, there's a giant called Jacob. There's a little ratty guy. There's um, you. You see, you see that Johnny finds a home among other outcasts like him. 
And that's that's a constant theme in these things. It's not the only one, of course. I mean, the Sarge has a very patriarchal character looking after men half his age. So there's that father son thing. Boys respond to that. Um, Dredger, as you say, a bastard, but also a loner. Uh, and, and in fact, I think I think in the very first battle episode, they blew his partner to bits in a in a car bomb. Uh, and it was like, yeah, we don't need him anymore. You know, Dredger can explain things for himself. Um, and so on and so forth. Crazy Keller is an absolute outsider because he's ever so slightly a criminal. Mm. And uh, it's it's that outsider's perspective that allows him to see trouble coming and anticipate things that the enemy are about to do before hidebound American army intelligence will will react uh all he has are his jeep which he's incredibly protective of and his sidekick ariel who's one of those long suffering little guys that everything happens to you know ariel's almost a muppet um and so on and so forth one of the things that, that I, I found quite striking, um, particularly around the, the, the reprint of the Sarge, is um, the reactions online. Um, and, you know, you get quite a few people who uh, will tie in uh, their opinions on things like Brexit and, you know, mm-hmm. Jinkoism and, and things like that. And it, it really struck me because I, 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 I remember watching a, um, there's a, a BBC Archive uh, Twitter account where they show photos or footage from 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 the BBC archive, and there was a a, a piece from I think either the early seventies or the late sixties, where somebody had done uh, an academic had done a bunch of work uh, <clears throat> on their war comics and how war comics could actually um, uh, encourage people to join the armed forces. Like the, the the army had paid him to do this research and go, oh yes, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you put pro army things into into comic yeah. books, then young men will, uh, will, will 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 join the army. Um, but what is really so striking, rereading um, uh, a lot of the, the 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 battle stuff, especially, and also into the the, the new battle action special. Is, this is this was never jingoistic, you know. The, the, there's little bits here and there, you know, a, a little bit of kind of demonization of the other and all this that, and the other. But it, you wouldn't call it patriotism. No, no. Uh, it's more. It's more the the understanding, the resigned acceptance that we have to do this. We have to keep going because we have to stop them. Mm. Uh, HMS Nightshade, uh, one of my favorite strips. John Wagner and Mike Western uh, has um, when when the enemy are referred to, it is it, it's as something far away because all they ever see of the enemy are aircraft and other ships mm. and U boats. But it's we have to stop them. We have to we have to put a stop to this because we can't allow this to keep going. That's one of the few times the strip does sort of nail its colors to the mast. Ha ha. Most of the time in that strip and in many other of the battle strips, um, what you see are people coping with the problems that that are far more immediate, right under their noses. If they have hatred for the enemy, it's the guy they've seen that day and not the regime he stands for. Mm. Um, That's that's something you see again and again. Uh, uh, The Sarge in particular, Yes, there's an anti-establishment pro-working class feel to that. I mean, officers are constantly shown to be incompetent or their ideas are outdated. And of course, wily old Jim Masters, the Sarge, is going to get his boys through. Um, That You get hit over the head a bit with that in a way that uh, perhaps in Charlie's War, you aren't because the message there is a, a bit more subtle a little bit more subtle. It's funny, you know, talking about the influence that these comics had on the the readership, Pat's talked about how he's met people who read Charlie's War and decided they would be pacifists or they would never join the army or that idea about being a soldier they had, no, would be shelved. Mm. Uh, That said, I think there, there are a fair number of people who read Battle and considering its overall impression as a whole, did join the military. Um, maybe it reinforced ideas they had about camaraderie, 
about adventure, about seeking action, that kind of thing. It, this gets you into awkward territory because it's just in, sometimes it's in, a lot of the time it's incredibly hard to do an anti-war story mm. because you're writing about a very dynamic, very physical, very, often very exciting and visually impressive um, uh, series of events. And it, it can be hard to be anti-war all the time, even when you're trying to be. Mm, mm. So that's slightly <laughs> off topic there, but you... No, 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 absolutely. It's, it's, it's fascinating because it, it, it's the when, uh, when people say war comics, quite often they think of that kind of jingoistic, um, uh, you know, mm. pro-war... You know, it's all about the action and, and the adventure. When, when mm -hmm. uh, at, at so many of these stories do undermine elements uh, of that. But I wanted to go and uh, talk about the the, the, the special in, in particular. Um, first off, because uh, was was it uh, you or our editors who tempted Andy Clark back for this uh, glorious cover? Um I think that might have been my idea because Andy's been doing a lot of covers for me in things like um, A Walk Through Hell and Marjorie Finnegan and Jimmy's Bastards. And uh, it struck me that because he's got such a fine sense of character, he would be the perfect guy to do one of those multi-character covers. Mm. So I think that was my idea. Because he, I mean, he's, he's um, I mean, obviously this isn't uh, specifically 2080, but he he, he was a, a fairly regular um, mm -hmm. uh made very regular appearances in 2080 and then uh, has obviously gone off to, to, to um, other things, but uh, no, it's, it, I mean, it's fantastic to see him, see him back. It's a cracker. It's a cracker of a cover. Uh, but yes, anyway, but I, the reason I bought, I, I also bought that up is because there's the, um, the web shop exclusive uh, version, which has this absolutely goddamn bonkers dredger cover by John Higgins. Now, if you're listening to this rather than watching it on YouTube, I do encourage you to go, to look at the timestamp and go and have a look at this because it's just, it's, I mean, that jaw alone. I yeah. mean, that's, that's a spirit of action right there, isn't it? Particularly with I, the, the, I, the, the, the guy with the gun. Oh yeah, I think so. Um, I think I might have done one of my dreadful little sketches for John. <laughs> On this, just to, um, <clears throat> I mean, I draw like Stevie Wonder, but I can do one of those terrible little sketches that just gets the idea across. So there would have been, you know, car heading towards the guy, gun in mouth, fist in yeah. the face, explosions. And of course, in the middle, Dredger just looking like he's, he can't wait to get stuck into more. Because yeah. I mean, out of all of them, you know, he's, he's, he's obviously the, 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 the furthest from World War II, but he's very much of the moment, you know, he, he is the spirit of the vigilante cop of the 1970s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, made, 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 made flesh. I mean, it would, it, I mean, we've kind of touched on the appeal of him as a, as, 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 as a character, but I, I'm interested because the, the comment you made towards the beginning where you're like, when, well, when Pat had moved on from action, um, were you know was was editorial strong enough to basically shepherd this thing in in a way that it wouldn't it wouldn't go too far and the answer was no mm. when you're when you're writing something like dredger uh, after the fact and considering your oeuvre yeah <laughs> shall we Three say? yeah, yeah. Um, is 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 there also a temptation to just go you know I just I press this just a little bit further than I normally would uh, well, in this instance, you know, write, writing the thing 40 years after the character appeared and really, uh, apart from language, being able to do whatever the hell you want, mm -hmm. there, there are no, you don't feel any restrictions whatsoever. You, you just feel, let's be appalling. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's funny, that one, because if you look at Dredger in action and then in battle, in battle, um, they change the emphasis slightly so that instead of working for the intelligence services, he works for military intelligence. Mm. Uh, he's still doing the same kind of things, but there is that slightly more military feel to it. He's more of a loner. Um, the art, I think, improves because you have John Cooper on every on every episode. But um, I was encouraged to write Dredger the way I did because the battle Dredger stories, although I know a lot of people think that he was watered down um, after he left action, 
Um, the battle dredger stories are some of my favorites. I had no idea what the action ones were like. Um, I certainly reading them now, I certainly find the battle ones a lot more coherent. You know, there are longer multi-part stories and so on. And there's still some extremely rough stuff in there. Um, in the very last episode, Dredger's chasing after some kidnappers who have uh, kidnapped his boss's son. And the little boy in the back of this taxi that these guys have stolen kicks one of the kidnappers out the door and under the wheels of an oncoming double decker bus. You know, and you just see these guys' legs fly out from under the, the bus's wheels. And uh, I'm thinking, well, obviously the kid learned from the master, but I really don't get any sense of, you know, the battle staff necessarily pulling their punches that much just because of what happened to action. Um, when you look at, at, at the strips in battle action, you don't you don't get a very strong sense of it being watered down at all. Mm. Battle continues on its merry way. And who knows, possibly because Dave Hunt was doing such a good job, uh, management didn't worry too much about the content in battle. It took care of itself. And I can't imagine the inclusion of characters from action being really being something that would get management carefully watching battle. Mm. After that point, um, they probably think, oh, well, we solved the action problem. No need to worry. <laughs> and let's talk a little bit about the art. Um, well, yeah. a bit more about the art on this, because um, yeah. you've <clears throat> wonderfully got uh, Mike Dory uh, on the uh, helmet of, of, of Hammer Force. I mean, was, was that a kind of uh, early, this, this has to happen? Like, you know, if it's going to be anybody, it has to be Mike. Um uh, well, very much so, yes. But um, he drew my Hellman story for the action special mm, yeah. a couple of years ago. Uh, and it was the, the fact that he was available was just wonderful. You know, I knew he was still working, but I wasn't sure he'd be interested in, in doing this. But being able to get him as one of the very few of the original artists uh, in terms of the co creators of these strips, um, talk about hitting the jackpot. It was just great. Um, you know, and it's it's still that sort of very precise yet somehow at the same time grimy, very action packed style of his, very strong on character mm -hmm. that I always appreciated. Um, I, I think it it helps a strip like Hellman to have a, an artist who can get across a really strong character. Um, there's, I, I think you can occasionally see Robert Shaw in there because, of course. Uh, Hellman, I think, was based visually on the Robert Shaw tank commander character from Battle of the Bulge. Mm. But it really helps. There's a real sort of strength and nobility to the character, which when you're trying to pass off a German panzer commander as a, a noble, honorable man, <laughs> uh, you know, these, these were guys who would have behaved honorably according to their own sense of what that meant. Mm. Uh, in terms of, you know, if you're talking about regular German army you, and you're talking about having having the opportunity to behave decently towards injured, captured enemy personnel, then yes, they probably would do the right thing. But what, what men like that would do in Russia to the civilian population, to people who most of them saw as subhuman, would not line up with our view of Hellman at all. Mm. At all. The, the good German idea you know that that informs hellman and uh, fighter from the sky and panzer g man and all the rest of them is essentially a fallacy mm. um it, they would not have been like that and they they certainly wouldn't have um done the things that hellman does where he he takes deliberate action to avoid enemy casualties by by pulling strange little jerry finley day style gimmicky tricks uh to um to avoid uh, unnecessary casualties. That's that's absolute balls. They would simply have poured in bullets and high explosive mm. until a white flag went up. Well, it was. I, I remember reading about the the exhibition. I think it was back in the nineties um, in Berlin, where because uh, uh, the the whole you know my my grandfather was in the Wehrmacht. He he, he wasn't in the SS, so that's so that's fine. right. This is the whole right. thing which, which basically detailed actually what the Wehrmacht had done. Mm -hmm. um, Un, not necessarily unprompted, but you know, uh, uh, without involvement from the SS, and that that caused quite a shock. 
yeah. in uh, in Germany. Um, yeah, um, I actually read a book um, a couple of years ago just called Soldiers, and very interesting transcripts of recordings made by the uh, the RAF of. Um, captured German airmen and sailors in British prisoner of war camps. Mm. Uh, very, very easy way of uh, finding out what the, the enemy's thinking because you just bug his, <laughs> his quarters. And so you get these long conversations between German prisoners who have no idea they're being recorded, uh, not letters home, not set in interrogation, not post-war justification, just what they said in conversation. And, you know, the good German must have been a pretty wily character because he never seems to have gotten caught the ones that they caught were were men of a different stripe i mean the most liberal comment in any of these conversations i came across was paraphrasing here was something along the lines of maybe he went a bit far but somebody had to do something about the jews <laughs> you know stuff like that um the, the reality is that the, these men went out to do what their superiors ordered them to do, to conquer enemy territory, and they behaved towards the locals according to their own culture mm. of Aryan supremacy or, or perhaps just whatever was going on in the minute, perhaps just the frustration of dealing with uh, an unruly local civilian population or just opportunity. Um, and, and they caused havoc. Mm. Mm. Um, coming back on to slightly lighter uh, notes. The artist. Um, yes, the artist. <laughs> the artist. Um, I, 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 the I, artist. Let's go from talking about uh, murderous uh, soldiers to talking about PJ, um, who, PJ, uh, Holden. Yeah. PJ Holden, who's on uh, the Sarge. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've worked you've worked fairly extensively with with, with yeah. PJ on on, yeah. on your war stuff. I mean, was 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 this kind of an an, an obvious fit? It was. It was. It was a no-brainer. Um, it, it, there's something so good-natured about PJ's work and about the character that he draws. Mm. Probably a reflection of the guy himself, actually, that does half the writer's work for him. Yeah. Um, it, the the readership is going to naturally sympathise with guys who look like that. Um, if you look at um, I think it's one of the old Titan Bad Company collections. I think it's Brett Ewens talks about his art on Bad Company, and he said he was going for Frank Miller meets Battle Picture Library. <laughs> well, I sometimes think PJ has somehow managed to nail Battle Picture Library meets the Beano, because <laughs> the characters, the characters, you can tell what's going on with them instantly. That you know the, the decency shines through on their faces. Mm. Uh, PJ is wonderful for that. And for a, a strip like the Sarge, where you're supposed to have this, this kind of fatherly, stern but fair leader, uh, who these much younger guys, this ragtag bunch, all look up to, um, they um there's there's a loner among them, but essentially they're mates. They're a bunch of mates looking out for each other on the long slog up in this instance, Italy. As I say, PJ does half most of the work for you before the the lettering even goes on the art. Um, we, yeah, it, it's it, it's kind of one of those things that so many of these war strips did have exactly that 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 quality you know for, for for all of the the the, the action and the grittiness of somebody like john cooper it's all about the character at the end of the mm -hmm. day you know it's the face i i, I posted up a, a i mean it's a, a, a unrelated um series but i think relevant i posted up a frame from um uh one eye jack right uh which of course is is, <laughs> is very violent in its own way and and um even just in this single panel the the expressions the fate you know the way he does faces just brings the whole thing alive so 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 what so what is a story of extreme vicious summary execution <laughs> effectively yeah. doesn't isn't softened but has has a character to it you know you you you, yeah. you, you can not necessarily identify but but understand and and see the person behind the act you know Yes, it, it carries you along, uh, just the same way that Cooper did on Johnny Red. Yeah. 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 And we've got um, uh, Keith Burns uh, and uh, Patrick Goddard and, and Chris Burnham as well. 
<laughs> who I wasn't expecting to see uh, on 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 a collection like this, uh, uh, an actual Yank uh, on uh, yeah. a collection. Yeah. Um, well, Keith was an obvious choice. He did my Johnny Red strip from yeah. uh, a few years ago. Patrick is one of those excellent, the kind of artist I love, a kind of a nuts and bolts artist who just brings clarity. And that's what any writer wants, I promise you, is clarity. Um, as for Chris, he was, I think, Oliver or Keith's idea, possibly Oliver's. Um, I knew who he was and I, I was familiar with his work. Um, but it was very interesting seeing him um, absorb not just the script, but the original Crazy Keller strips uh, that we sent him and respond to that, that kind of classic 70s, 80s British comic storytelling by Eric Bradbury. Um, and he actually said to me he wanted to he wanted to come up with a style not that, that was not like his his usual style, something that reflected what he was reading in the old strips, not something that would match it, mm. but something that would fit in that world. And I really appreciated him putting that much thought into it. Um, he, uh, in the end, of course, he did a fantastic job. He's really, I'd never worked with him before. And there's always that sort of slight nervousness when you, when art comes in. Yeah. But honestly, it was like he was looking in my head. He caught the kind of hundred mile an hour, all guns blazing character of that strip perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, he did a tremendous job. I'm really looking forward to doing more with him actually. There's, for me, there was, there was a, a slight uh, feeling, and this may just be me, of, of almost kind of like mash like humor. You know, mm -hmm. just the, just the the, the 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 characters, the faces uh, have that uh, um, um, kind of rabbit caught in the headlights look yeah. to them, which I I, I I always felt was uh, an awful lot, particularly some of the you know less uh, less strident characters from uh, from Mash. But um, because uh, the, the 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 one we haven't talked about is Kevin O'Neill, right? Um, now or, or John Higgins? Oh yes, of course, John Higgins. Yes, yeah. sorry, John. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, Higgins, Higgins is, is quite easy. I mean, the guy's brilliant. Mm. Um, and for all that sleaze and filth and wrongdoing <laughs> and dark humor and action uh, and nasty, nasty, nasty things going on, it has to be John Higgins. I mean, he just did a fantastic job. Um, he, uh, he said to me when he read the script, he said, thank God you haven't changed. And I was delighted when the art came in to see that he hadn't either. Uh, <laughs> really... <laughs> Really a fantastic job. Um, I, I think I'm pretty sure he, he was my idea. He would have been my idea because John and I have done quite a bit over the years, not in a little while, but, uh, you know, he drew the boys, he drew some war stories, uh, drew a strip called Pride and Joy for me. Um, and he's an old mate. And it just seemed like the obvious thing to get someone that good mm. into in, into this this special, I mean, the cover is just a bonus. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's just, just just talk about Kevin because I mean, this right. is, this is his first. Um, uh, how can you put it? Uh, reports of his retirement were greatly exaggerated because uh, mm -hmm. I I, uh, I think I think he was saying that you know uh, Alan had said he was retiring from comics and everyone assumed that that um, Kevin was joining him uh, mm -hmm. in a kind of Burton Ernie style um, <laughs> setup at home. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, so this is this is his first work since League of Extra uh, uh, um, uh, sequential work since League of Extraordinary Gentlemen wrapped up, mm -hmm. and and it, it it's very much other stuff. But I mean, without giving too much weight, because we have to be careful, because yeah. the, the the kids are all okay. Strip, um, uh, it'd be very easy to spoil it. Mm -hmm. But he he does something quite special with this, doesn't he? So you've you, you, you've got his normal. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen style, for want of mm -hmm. a, a, a better phrase, kind of like, you know, the latter day uh, Kevin O'Neill. But then you've also got some colour work as well, which is really special. Right, right. Um, Kevin, I think, I think you have Oliver to thank for mm. selecting Kevin for the job. I, uh, w when I wrote the strip, I had no idea who would draw it. Um, and Oliver had a couple of suggestions. And then he said, oh, what about Kevin O'Neill? Mm. He's retired, but maybe he'll come out of retirement for this. And I didn't know 
that Kevin, that people had said that Kevin had retired. I don't think he actually did. I think, as you <laughs> say, it was just people made the assumption. Yeah. Um, but they got in touch with him, and I was thinking, well, there's no way Kevin will say yes. I mean, it's, it's Kevin O'Neill, you know, and he said yes. And um, I must say, he absolutely nailed it. It wasn't just a case of, oh, I'm working with Kevin O'Neill. Tick that box. Now I can say I've worked with Kev. Uh, I can die happy. Now it was, he also did an absolutely incredible job. He nailed it. He saw what I was going for mm. and he did a fantastic job on the strip. Um, I mean, brief segue here, uh, much to your chagrin, I'm sure it's not the last work we'll be doing together. Uh, uh, Kevin has another script of mine he's working on right now. Uh, but, but enough of that. Um, he, no, he did a fantastic job on this and, and having, having someone of his stature, Mm. on the book is not just enormously helpful. It means everything because it's the guy who blew my mind with Nemesis the Warlock when I was an 11-year-old kid um, working on one of my scripts in this special. And it helps to make the special special, as it were. I I still go back and look at things like Robusters and ABCs, but especially Nemesis, especially the the first and third books that Kevin did uh, and look at that stuff and think, my God, where was that coming from? What's he channeling there? How did, mm. how on earth did they think this was appropriate for kids? Thank God they did. <laughs> well, um, what, what I love about the fact he's, he's, he's on the, uh, he's on kids will. Okay. Is um, it, I set up the interview that you guys did with comic book.com um, uh, the other day to, uh, you know, reveal some of the unlettered pages that, that, that Kev had done. And I mean, every answer that, that like you're, you, you were great, but every answer uh, Kev gave was absolute gold. And yeah. there was just that wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, reminder that he was there yeah. when this happened, when the action got canned, he was there. Yeah. And um, is this wonderful anecdote. He said, well, you know, it was, it was Christmas Eve and that was the deadline for two, the first issue of 2000 AD. Uh, to go through the process of, of printing and distribution, and uh, the, the 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 shock of of um, action um, being uh, uh, not banned, but you know inverted commas banned. He he was literally there. So uh, this is a wonderful anecdote. On Christmas Eve, everyone else is buggered off uh, to the pub or to home, and then <clears throat> uh, Kev whiting out blood splatter at the top of a page and Kelvin Gosnell at the bottom of exactly the same, like they're kind of clambering over each other uh-huh. to, to get these pages. And it's such, just a, such a wonderfully evocative image, yeah. but you know, the, the, it's, it's kind of like the, almost the archeological scar of that yeah, yeah. moment. And he, he was there, you know, he was living it. Yeah. He remembers it. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, when you again, we want to avoid spoilers, but when you when you see the strip, uh, and it does begin like there's a little text piece before every every one of the strips, um, and the one before Kids Rule OK says what follows is fiction. It's important for people to remember that. <laughs> you could almost see, you could almost imagine Kevin and Kelvin overhearing something of what follows. Mm-hmm. You know? No, it's, it's 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 wonderful. It's uh, you know, and and you're absolutely right. It's kind of it is the outlier, but at the same time, you need that bit of history. Yes, you, know, you, you need you, people need to understand what happened in that moment. Yes, it it was a chance for some. I keep saying commentary, but maybe commentary is the wrong word. Whimsy, mm. maybe. <laughs> Uh, you know, to, to tie perhaps to tie together some of the events of the controversy mm. uh, and fictionalize them, um, and and to get a story out of them that might not be wholly accurate, but that perhaps car- catches the spirit of what went on. Mm. I, I just I want to wrap up really, and just ask you: Have you achieved what you set out to do with this? Because I mean, this this is this is quite a novel thing. We've we've never really done something like this. I know it's an anthology. But it, it's kind of like an original hardcover anthology, so it, it's 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 mm-hmm. not something that we've ever done before. You know, we've had we've had some specials, but they've, they've had big creative teams 
Um, this is very focused, very particular to your mm. interests. Um, and, and harking back to a, to a moment that, that, you know, the vast majority of people just won't, won't know about this, you know, mm. the, the, uh, the, the, there'll maybe know about uh, the, the action controversy from, you know, reading books or watching the, the 2008 documentary. But did, 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 did you achieve what you set out to do with it? Um, well, well, we'll, we'll have to see when the book comes out, but what, what I wanted to achieve was a celebration of one of the greatest British comics and the people who put it together. Um, uh, the work of Jerry Finley day and Tom Tully and Eric Bradbury and Alan Hebden and John Cooper and Joe Calhoun and all the rest of them to, to highlight the importance of their work uh, not just in and of itself, although it is excellent. These are stories that, as I say, were printed um, after Battle had turned the corner mm. and was doing superior material, uh, a corner that I would argue action never had time to turn. So there's that. There's pointing out the the place of, of the work these guys did in British comics history, battle where it all began uh, without the success of which none of the rest would have happened. No action, no 2000 AD. And who knows what that would have meant for comics as a whole. We know we talked last time about the importance of that generation on what would become vertigo. Mm, mm. Um, you have a great deal of creativity there. Um, there's no doubt that uh, many of those those people were would uh, would have gone on to some sort of career in the creative arts. There's no guarantee it would have been comics, mm. but battle and battle action kicked off um, the creation of a place where they could find a home. So that's important. Um, beyond that, uh, I, I would like to I would like to see the individual writers and artists um, and their work celebrated. I would like to see more of it back in print. Um, and because I think there is still life in the characters, because I, I, I don't think they're ready to be consigned to the, the dustbin of comics history. Um, hopefully, hopefully we can do more. Hmm. Uh, I said at the start that I wasn't getting any real sense of urgency about more battle or action specials. So by helping to kick this thing off, maybe, maybe we can make this an annual thing. Maybe we can, maybe we can have another one next year. And I would love to bring in some more writers. There are people champing at the bit to write uh, Nina Petrova and Death Squad and HMS Nightshade and so on. It would be wonderful if we could do that. So um, let's celebrate the originals for their own quality, for the, the part they play in history. And let's maybe see if we can get more material like this going forward. We're, we're, we're chatting away about the Ooh, battle action. Nice, I've seen that. Yeah. Lovely, lovely, lovely bit of spot varnish <laughs> on the uh, on the title yeah. there and everything. So yes, very, very nice. Um, uh, I've had a chat with, 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 with Garth uh, about this for this episode, but I, I, it, it's great to be able to get you both on to, to talk about your, uh, your contributions because um, the Garth's love of this shines through you know it, it, it when we were chatting you said you know battle action was has a lot to answer for you know it's, it's kind of the foundation not just of his obsession with with world war ii and military history but also with uh with with, with, with comics and the kind of characters that he he draws or he writes as well um so i i, I wanted to get your um your uh, sense of uh how you feel about this project you know uh, whether, whether this is a this is the comic that has had a, a similar effect on you I, Keith we'll, we'll, we'll start with you because you you spend your days drawing an awful lot of uh, military aircraft don't you yeah it's got it's a strange existence <laughs> slightly niche um well I, I didn't really get into comics until I was a bit older I think I think the first comics I ever bought was uh, the first comic I ever bought was Starcom which was a Bizarre nineteen eighties toy that had a comic that went with it. These mechanized little wind up things in that would kind of unfold and do all sorts of amazing things. And because somebody down the road had some of them toys, and the comic also had a set of three D goggles on the front, 
I was all over it and I read it and thought it was amazing as in, you know, the 3D aspect of it. And then the fact that somebody had the toys down the road and you could link in. But I was, from a young age, I was quite obsessed with um, hardware. So like most people, I suppose, you start to get into that kind of stuff with Star Wars and Star Wars toys. So, you know, having the next wing and looking at it, looking at all the fiddly bits and be able to look at it from those different angles. So that kind of got me interested in that side of things. And then years later, I heard in the documentary, George Lucas talking about when they started doing the Star Wars stuff, you know, putting it together, they didn't have the money, but they're making the effects up. And to show or to explain how the dogfights were going to work with X-Wings and TIE Fighters, they actually put World War II footage in of dogfights, you know, just to, to show the kind of stuff they were going to do. Um, and I'd always been interested in that kind of thing in, in art in school. I wasn't interested. I was awful at everything. I, I knew I could draw, and that was always interesting. But the other thing that interested me was black and white history books, mm. you know, about World War II, because the images are just so kind of ridiculous. It loads them so full of movement. They're so kind of poignant and terrifying at the same time. And even when I was young, there was something that kind of uh, drew me to that. So... I didn't in the same way Gareth did. Was, I wasn't into air action comics or battle library because it, it just wasn't something that was around much of the time. I think it was a couple of kids and they had Commander comics. Mm. Um, but it kind of passed me by when I was young. Um, and it was only later on, after I'd gone to our college, after I'd got booted out of our college and just had normal jobs for years, mm. um, I went back into a comic shop just because I'd, I'd read books and I was bored of reading all the stuff that I'd gone through. And I think the first thing I saw was there was a Transformers poster to my fellow called Pat Lee in the window of Nostalgia Comics in Birmingham that drew me in. Mm. And then I started yeah, sauntering and looking at stuff. And then the first thing I, I, I came across was um, uh, The Losers, which completely blew my mind, the idea that, you know, the kind of comics had come on that much and made these... It was basically like a kind of a movie in your hand with the amount of movement and kinetic energy that kind of jock had captured and all that stuff. And then I went on to all sorts of vertical and started getting reprints of um, 2000 ideas. So should backtrack slightly that when I was madly into comics was when I was about 14, 15, it was all 2000 ideas and Judge Dredd. Me and my friend were absolutely obsessed with it for years. Um, but of course, same as most people go to university, meet girls, discover beer, and you just kind of you leave afraid. But it was so great when I came back to it because... It was, it was kind of it, the interest I'd had to kind of rekid all the stuff that was there that originally drew me to kind of it, the images, you know, in history books of World War II, all the kinetic energy and the drama and the poignant image and everything. And it's fast forward to a few years later after about 10 years of trying to actually draw comics and then eventually getting into it um, and going through all the reprints. So the Johnny Red reprints that come out and all them gorgeous cover books, which I have knocking around somewhere of... Um, you know, Air Ace and Battle Picture Library. Mm. And where did I got to then? I can't remember. Oh, God. And, yeah, so I ended up working with John McRae doing uh, kind of bits and bobs on the boys where John was kind of teaching me to do bits and bobs. Then I started doing a couple of World War II bits of flashbacks within the boys' stories. Um, and that was, I was kind of in heaven then and John knew that was the kind of stuff that I could do um, without much, well, not without much effort, but that I kind of went completely overboard on. So he let, let me get on with that. Mm. So I thought, oh my God, I can go mad here. So I went, went mad, put loads of effort in building models and all sorts, you know, for about two pages worth of stuff. I spent, you know, a week getting all this stuff ready for it and, and then go mad. And, it, and um, I really enjoyed That was a bit I really enjoyed. I liked all the other stuff about learning stuff, but that was a bit that I knew I could kind of do. And I almost had a, you know, hundreds of thousands of images in my head from all the books that I'd looked at and all the stuff that, you'd, you, you know, you'd seen and absorbed over, over all the time that I wasn't really um, doing any art stuff. I was still absorbing loads of stuff the whole time. So then when it came to actually figuring out how to make things look like they moved on the page, which is what really interests me, you know, trying to capture the kinetic energy and the kind of physical flight, you know, the physical action of flight and making everything look like it really moves. Um, I, f I found that really easy and it was the bit that I could kind of you know enjoy the most and figure out this, this storytelling and making because there's one thing um, trying to figure out how one image works and, and getting the composition and everything right but the fascinating thing about comics which 
you realize is really, really tricky is making the whole page move as one kind of image. So from getting um, whatever the first panel is, and you know, with Patrick will know all these tricks, but you know, leaving the eye and make an aircraft fly from one panel into the next panel. So you're going all the way down. Um, and that absolutely fascinated me. And it, yeah, so adding that to the to the aircraft and all the movement, explosions and everything, the idea there was so much movement going on in, in them scenes anyway, it then became really easy to kind of make it work its way all the way down through the page. So that was all the stuff that really interested me. Um, to skip forward again, then I was working on the boys and then what did I do then? There was a horrible thing that happened where I was doing some stuff for, was it in Dynamite? And that was it. I got offered a 12-month contract with Dynamite that was exclusive. I thought, oh my God, this is it, big break. And it was after I'd done the, uh, the story called Castles in the Sky with Gareth, where um, a, a fella had done the first issue and then he had, he had problems and we dropped out and I got, I got asked to do the next two. And that was all kind of um, flying forces over Europe uh, and lots of aerial action. So I figured out a lot of stuff in that. And then uh, I got offered a 12-month contract with Dynamite and I didn't know what I was going to be doing. I knew it wouldn't be war stuff, but you know, it's at that stage in your career where you just have to kind of not go with whatever is offered, but you know, you have to take it something that's a decent opportunity for exposure and everything, as well as somebody actually paying you through the work, which is a <laughs> big, massive thing. And then, so I did that, but I ended up doing like the Shadow and Green Hornet, which I, I didn't even really know what I was doing on that. And then I did a story called XCon. But the, the hideous thing that happened was I got offered the 12 month uh, contract said yes. So I thought, Oh my God, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened. I'm finally going to make a living out of it, you know, at comics. And then two days later, Gareth sent me an email saying, um, have you ever heard of Johnny red? Would, would you be interested in working on, on, you know, an eight months? Oh, you've got to be joking me. She waited ages for any kind of a break. And then literally a dream job comes along where, cause by that point I'd, got all the reprints and devoured all that and thought, oh my God, this is what I wish I was around to be drawn in the mm. 60s and 70s. And it's just, nobody does it now. And then of course it appears after I just committed to a 12 month thing. And um, I remember running upstairs with my wife going, oh my God, you won't believe it. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And she couldn't even think. Out. They said, well, just ask to see if, you know, they might wait like Gareth and uh, they would wait on the Johnny Red thing. Luckily it was with them. Um, What's it? Uh, Steve White was the editor, and he, he came back and said, Yeah, it's no problem. We can wait a year. So it was kind of really street relief. So then I spent that year, you know, to, trying, to, trying to get better at storytelling and all the stuff and figure work, which was my, the thing that, well, every artist needs to get better at. But then on the last book, I did the ex con story, which is really interesting. I, I made a point of forcing myself to use traditional brush and ink. You know, so the, in that last job, I was kind of getting ready for doing Johnny Red. So, I mean, it was like pulling teeth initially, but then it kind of started working after about six, six issues. So then when I went on to Johnny Red, then I was like, oh my God, how the hell do I follow these artists? You know, John Cooper and, and Joe Calhoun, it was really properly had me awake for weeks on end. Um, and, it, you know, Garrett, I can't remember what Garrett said. He said something funny and probably quite dark about the, the artist. But yeah, he put my mind at ease um, and I just kind of got on with it then. So I didn't. I didn't. Re, I didn't try and replicate anything. I just thought, of, you know, them two artists are absolute legends. There's no way you could compete with them. So you just have to kind of do do your own thing. Well, on the, the the strip that you've done for uh, Battle Action is, is Johnny Red versus uh, Scream of the Stuckers. So uh, uh, mm. talking about God, about merging these two things. But I, I, I guess it's always like a busman's holiday now. That you know, you're, you're such a dab hand at um, World War Two air action. Yeah, well, there's, I've still got the original models. If you look here slightly, there's just shelves full of ridiculous aircraft and models that I've built, wow. built a library of, over years of doing it. And, and it takes ages, but then once you have them, it's, you know, it's like I'm a library book. So when when Gareth um, asked about Johnny Reddick, I said, you know, there's no way you're going to say no, because I absolutely loved the last one that I did, got to figure out how to draw the characters and... You know, had all the mainly had all the models, which saves a lot of time. So you know, you've got a model of the hurricane, and and it was just everything that I needed, which which not only saves a lot of time, but you just have a knowledge of what's required. You know, and and every it's kind of everything there already, so you don't really need to worry about that side of it, which I had to first time round. Um, and then 
I hadn't heard a scream or so I had to, but I got sent the reprints and I read that too and I thought, God, this fella's amazing. <laughs> He's such a hideous, hideous character, which is great. And the idea of putting, you know, him up against Johnny Red and then, and then having um, von Jürgen in as well, who's kind of, you know, the decent German who then has to go up against Screamer's hideousness as well. It was just great. Yeah, so the, it was a no-brainer. So, I mean, in, in, in terms of... Because of, uh, one of the things I, I, I asked... Garth was, you know, um, whether it was difficult to avoid slipping into pastiche or, you know, just just mim um, uh, mimicking what had gone before. And he said, well, I, 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 wish, I wish I could uh, write like uh, with the economy of Jerry Finley day. You know? <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's something similar like that with, 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 with the art. Because, you know, people like uh, um, John Cooper, especially, were just so uh, unique. And, and singular mm -hmm. in his in his style and so dynamic. Can you sometimes feel yourself just getting kind of pulled from pillar to post, or do you avoid looking at that and just go, "I'm going to do my own thing"? Yeah, you kind of you, you look at it, you really study it, absorb it all. Like I really poured over all the artwork, and then I just thought, I've got no chance. I'll just I'll just do you know I have to do what I do, and then and then kind of rest assured of myself that you know Gareth asked me to do it. He trusts me with it. I knew how much Johnny Red meant to him. So, you know, I had to kind of uh, fall back on that any time I started doubting what was going on. But, but you know, you look at, you look at the, the artwork and it is absolutely amazing. But then I look at John Cooper's stuff and all his figure work and his characterization, and everything, storytelling, the movement, everything gorgeous. But his aircraft weren't great. So that was something I could look at and go, yeah, that's a fairly ropey looking hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> I had to find some slither of hope in there that I could, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, Patrick, we'll come to you now because um, because uh, uh, Nina Petrova and the Angels yeah. of Death, which is the strip that, that you've illustrated, is a, a, a Johnny Red spinoff. Yeah. Uh, you know, she was a, she was a character from that. Uh, how, how how did you find? I mean, you know, she had a look. She was uh, a, a character in the strip, but but you put uh, you have to put her centre stage, don't you? Yeah, uh, I didn't know much of. About her, but it was. Uh, I think the biggest thing I read was in uh, Garth and Keith's Johnny Red Titan book. Uh, so that was probably the most I've seen her in the strip, other than the couple of things I looked on Google. Because I don't remember, you know, I, I grew up reading Battle Action Force, and I don't remember her in the Johnny Red strip at all. It was mainly all John Cooper again. But uh, yeah, I had no memory of her. So it was just going in fairly fresh. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was it's hard to remember. I did it two years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's the trick is it to remember. Yeah. But I like to look at Patrick's stuff because it was quite good the way Garth had done it where the two stories led into each other and kind of yeah. crossed over. So it was I interesting to look through Yeah, to look look through Patrick's stuff and then just have a look at the you know how the, the airfield was laid out and then having to study that and then oh, did you? Break it up. Yeah, yeah, I found that really interesting. <laughs> That's a nerd level you go to, isn't it? <laughs> Well, I, I wasn't sure if mine followed yours because Screamer's got his arm in a sling. So I wasn't sure if your story... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yours comes after, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, so I was, I was really looking at it because there's a bit where they two of them crop past each other, don't they? Nina's yeah. in the background and one, and Johnny's another. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Yeah. No, it was, uh, it was a thrill to draw uh, Johnny Red. Only got to draw him in one or two panels. But... Uh, it was uh, it was like such a buzz, just like, oh, it's Johnny Red, <laughs> you know. I, you know, he never thought, I, you know, I drew the Sniper Elite, and that was under the Battle banner a couple of years ago, and I thought that would be my only chance to draw in for Battle, as it was. But so uh, when this came up, it was like, yes, yes, I'll do it. Because <laughs> it, 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 uh, it's such a legacy. The, the, these mm -hmm. uh, these comics, you know, and and uh, not not just in terms of of the impact they have on readers who go on to work in in, in comics, but also um, as I discussed with Garth, you know, no battle, no action, no two thousand AD, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and the, all the impact that that has had on on uh, on, on comics history, but it, with something like this, it, it, it it's, it's clear that it's plugging into that, you know, that, that it's that it's grounded in to a degree the nostalgia of of, mm. uh, of the originals. But it does it does feel fresh because they, you know, comics have changed <laughs> yeah. over over the last uh, uh, 45, 50 years. Um I mean did, did you guys get a sense of of striking a balance between what had gone before and your own styles, your own way of telling 
uh, stories, your own kind of comics? Uh, yeah, you know, like Keith, I'd look through like all Cam Kennedy stuff, Ian Kennedy, and I was, you know, you just think oh, it, it can depress you as well as inspire you. Uh, the one thing I am, <laughs> the one thing I'm pleased about is I like, looking through the old stuff when they're doing nine panel pages. Oh, I'm glad modern comics are not quite like that anymore. Yeah, because that was tough. But uh, yeah, I I just approach it as the same as even same as the 2000 AD stuff it's it's just i try and draw in the way i draw but with a nod to everything else in the past and uh hopefully i'll i'll strike a balance in there if i can mm. i think some of it crossed over quite well because there's a lot of, especially with the stuff that gareth writes you can see where he got it from there's a lot of yeah. kind of dark gritty content in that original stuff you know because a lot of the the battle action and air race and all that, you know, they were worked on by veterans, you know, people that wrote the stories and drew them as well. So there was a real element of realism in there, even though it was still supposed to be a comic and there was lots of bit of gung ho stuff. And um, so you can see where, yeah, where Gareth gets out and he obviously then puts that into, into the story. So that's, it's, it's modern, but it's not, if that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I want to talk to you both about, um, uh, Action, not with a, with a capital A, but just drawing action. Because um, uh, I, I, looking at stuff, I, I, I get the sense that you there are similarities in the way that you both approach um, drawing action, but all the, the kind of subtle differences. I just wanted to, to, to get an idea from you both about the, the, the challenges of drawing quite high, you know, fast-paced uh, action sequences, but keeping the 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 characters centered in these things particularly when you know you've got, you've got skies full of identical looking <laughs> aircraft I, mean, I, guess, I guess that's why johnny uh, one of the great reasons why johnny went in a in a hurricane in a in a soviet squad yeah. you know exactly what he's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah i wanted to get a, a, a sense of you know how, how you approach action and uh, how you keep those characters centered uh, come to, to Patrick first. Uh, oh, well, I haven't done much sort of dog fights or anything like that. So that, that, it was a bit of a challenge. So I looked at Keith's work quite a lot uh, to try and sort of get, you know, even an ounce of that energy that I could. I've always enjoyed sort of action, like fighting and getting the characters, as you said, sort of reacting to things and trying, you know, you want to sort of exaggerate it to a certain degree, but then sort of just... Uh, you know, keep sort of a, keep it a bit real. But uh, one of the things I find with action is that almost like letting the reader understand the gutters. Like when you go from one panel to the next, your reader should be able to sort of fill in the blanks, as it were. So you should have you should set up the one action scene in one panel. It should follow in to the next panel, but it shouldn't be too confusing for the reader to sort of lose that energy or the pace of it. So. Uh, you know, that just comes with experience and time and just probably reading lots of comics over the years. But uh, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, with I really, you know, I looked at Ian Kennedy's and Keith's and just anything I had, planes and Colin Wilson's Battling Britons as well. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. Sort of, yeah, it's just like, you know, hardware is not my strong point generally. So it was just really like, how am I going to do this? But as you know, I wasn't going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my mind's the other way around where I think, you know, figures and fighting and stuff, that kind of stuff terrifies me. <laughs> Whereas planes flying through the sky is just, you know, easy. But yeah, it's similar to Patrick. You just, uh, the most important thing, even though you, you kind of get obsessed with all the hardware stuff, is just storytelling and keeping it as clear as possible. So you, you have to, you have to be able to look at it and it has to instantly make sense. If it doesn't make sense and it's, it's not working, so I'm always really careful at doing that whenever I'm working and stuff and just having, even though it's very hard not to get over complicated when you know you send you've got aircraft flying all over the place you have to even within that find something really clear and just yeah just make sure it makes sense yeah and then, yeah and then obviously leading the eye from one to the next is you know that kind of helps with that because you're directing towards whatever the interesting point of the next panel is mm. it, it was an interesting point raised um earlier when you were talking about how you came to be interested in, in uh, this kind of thing. Um, about George Lucas using 
footage of old dog fights mm. uh, because it, it's it's something that really struck me. Um, not just reading the old battles, but also uh, reading this special is just how much the 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 visual language, the iconography, the the um, just everything about it is seared into uh, our minds and and, and forms such an important part of the 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 language of visuals of comic books. Mm. You know, when 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 you, when you think about the kind of action orientated stuff, there's all these influences, but it, it keeps coming back to these. War films. <laughs> yeah, everything goes back to Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 it really, it, when, when you think about it, it really strikes me that uh, our, our visual language is imbued with the imagery of this conflict. I guess, I guess, because there were, you know, uh, so yeah, they've already seen these films, haven't they? And they've, it's all sort of embedded into our psyche. So when it's on a comic page, it's, it's almost familiar and sort of. Uh, you know, you can sort of attach to sort of the images that, you know, you either do in school, learning about history, but, you know, everybody's seen a black and white war film over the years. Mm. So it's, it's just, it has that same sort of nostalgic buzz about it, I find. Mm. And everyone knows where a dive of an aircraft sounds like and machine yeah. guns going off it, running around as boys doing it. You definitely get the sound effects reading your comics. You can, you, you know, you always hear the screeching on some of the planes and you think, my God, how hard, you know, you're in a comic, but you can get sound effects from it. It's brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, I did. You go to extreme lengths. We start trying to figure out how, you know, which way the aileron should be moving for the way the aircraft is, <laughs> is maneuvering in it. <laughs> I got to the, what did I do from one of them? The, the out of the blue one I did was all about mosquitoes. I, built a, like a, a little tiny cockpit, but kept it open so you could kind of, you had all the 3D, so it was almost like a digital model, yeah. but, you know, you had a little tiny plastic one in front of you so you could, you could use, and then yeah, build an engine so when you shoot an aircraft and it blows up, you know what the engine looks like. Oh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's too deep, it's too... It's That's something. the extra mile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I've never, I've never studied... Uh, muscles in the human figure in my life. <laughs> I've got no idea what a delta. I've got. I've heard of a deltoid, but <laughs> the thing is, if 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 you don't do the work, somebody will notice. There'll always be one person. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's probably Garth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it. So I, I remember chatting to Ron Smith years ago, and he said um, he used to get really because like, he flew Spitfires. Um, in in oh, no, that's in, uh, World War, which yeah. is, is still bonkers. Um, yeah. He said uh, the bane of his life was what he called spitter spotters, <laughs> who were these people who wanted to know like the the um, the, the engine number of the planes that it. Because uh, I, yeah, I, I yeah. seem to recall that he, you know he helped deliver um, uh, Spitfires. Oh, you know, where where did you take it and what was the, the engine number? Like, oh, I don't bloody know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, they're, they're called Gareth Ennis. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he did, I remember in, 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 the, in the Johnny Red one, there's a point where Johnny had landed a hurricane under a, under a tree and then got out and wandered off and then I'd sent the artwork in. He said, mm, so I'm not sure about the nose of that hurricane there. It looks a bit like a Mark I hurricane to me. <laughs> and it's supposed to be a Mark II. And this is, you know, this is about issue seven. I'd made <laughs> one error on the nose cowl and it kind of looked a bit stubby. It's almost mm. terrifying to work with. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if PJ was on this call, he would be regaling us about uh, stories <laughs> of drawing um, incorrect tanks and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, as as um, as Carlos Scala said, uh, thank God for the internet. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember chatting to Mick McMahon once, and he didn't care about for reference. He said, "If it looks good at that one angle." I could draw the same like lawmaster from a different angle, and it was not the same bike. But he said, if it looks good from that angle yeah. as well, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, not a care in the world. Yeah. And I thought that's brilliant. Oh man, well, that's that's a, that's a funny thing is that the amount of effort I put into all this, I know hardly anyone's going to know it. Yeah. <laughs> it's will. just done for pure pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah except Gareth. Yeah. yeah, beyond that, it's an it's a age old thing, isn't it? If it looks right, it is right. And that's yeah. you know, doesn't matter how how much you've kind of worked. On, or a photograph if it looks wrong even though you know it's right then it's wrong it's kind of that's it comes back to the same with the clarity thing yeah, yeah.
there's that that wonderful uh, story. I think it's from the, the 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 mega history when Mick was doing the first dread episode to see print because it's got the the um, Empire State Building in, <laughs> and I, I, I think some either him or somebody else basically went. He he thought using reference was cheating, <laughs> so he was just trying to draw. The Empire State from 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 memory or something, and eventually <laughs> Pat just sent him a picture of the Empire State. This is what it looks like. Use it. I remember first when I first found out that everyone used reference of photographs. You know, initially I was like, "Cheers, cheers!" And then then I thought, "Hold on, I can do that as well." And yeah, it's absolute it's revelation. It's, it's this notion that it's cheating. Like you're still yeah. roaring it. Like it, yeah, I, I, I know when, when um, uh, the the Hawk the Slayer. Um, the, the first cover went up and, and people go, oh, it looks like... Um, it, was, it was always a range of people that people thought it looked like, which shows that actually it didn't look like any of them. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, it's Russell T. Davis or it's Hugh Jackman or blah, blah, blah. And uh, there, was, there was somebody who commented saying, um, oh, this is, just, this is just copying photos. And so, so you're saying that if you just... If you decided to just copy a photo, you could produce a cover like... Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, this is it. Yeah. Like that, you know? I just Yeah. I remember once meeting Neil Adams at a convention somewhere and he said an amazing thing where he said, he said, all your friends are stopping you from getting better. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, because what you should be doing is tracing stuff. But because everyone, everyone says that that's cheating, you're completely doing yourself out of developing a skill. He said, you need to trace and trace and trace because it develops so much muscle memory and makes for really interesting mark making. You know, and, you, and that's one that fascinating the idea that it's absolutely poo pooed in any mm. art course or, you know, any teacher or anything, but it does, it does, you learn loads from it. And then when you stop, you just have all this information and, you know, you then, you then get to use. I remember tracing a, a lot of Kevin Maguire stuff when I was a teenager. And it's just to get all the expressions and faces and things like that. And I just had sheets of tracing paper. I must have been about 17, 18. And I just used to f- copy them all all the time. And as you said, it's just muscle memory then. And so yeah. some of it just sinks in and uh, you can recall later. Yeah, I've still got some GCSE art projects that were just... Um... Copies of Martial Law by Kevin O'Neill. <laughs> I, I did a Bolland uh, Batman once, and I think I did it red. <laughs> My art teacher thought it was great. I said, I was inspired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah inspired by. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, 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 I know you're both really, really busy, so we'll, we'll, we'll round off now. But um, uh, the stuff in the battle action special is, is fantastic. You know, it's, it's, it's really nice to see. Um, just, just you all having a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm looking forward to reading through all the stories and seeing all that. You know, yeah. all the, you said you know it really jumps off the page, and you see people are enjoying themselves. Mm. I think it was uh, there was because everyone just had about nine, ten pages. It was sort of everyone just seemed to just put it all in those few pages, and you hopefully, if everybody does that, the whole book will look amazing anyway. So. Mm. I think uh, it's a bit less pressure than doing the whole book all by yourself. So when you just <laughs> yeah. do each little bit, you know, it's... Uh, no, I really enjoyed doing mine. Really did. So, yeah, you know, I loved it as well. Yeah, it was great. So I hope it does really well. It seems to be a lot of talk, a lot of buzz about it. So 